Tropical Storm Lee is right at the brink of becoming a hurricane. And when he does, he's looking to break some records that were set back in 2005 with Hurricane Wilma. Let's take a look today on Weather Center Nazario to see what the likelihood of these records being broken for 2023 are, as well as what CPC has in store for us for the remainder of September with their latest chart update. I also want to take a brief moment at the very end of this episode, episode 22, to talk about some new potential hazards that I want to bring awareness to as we go through the rest of September and the latter half of the peak of our hurricane season. Fasten your seatbelts, folks. I'm going to make this quick, but I also want to make it an exciting episode, so let's strap in and get in here. Alrighty, ladies and gentlemen, here we go. Starting off on National Hurricane Center's homepage, Tropical Storm Lee remains the talk of the town that has the weather community abuzz with all sorts of excitement and hype, tracking him off to the west-northwest, preparing for his intensification to an actual full-fledged hurricane. We also can't forget about Invest 96L. 96L is still situated off the western African coastline, working its way off to the west and northwest at a fairly decent click. Chances of development have dropped over the last 24 hours. Yesterday, we were up to as high as a 70% chance. Now we're down to 6 over the next seven days. A lot of the computer models suggest we'll still see development out of this entity. However, this is definitely not going to pose a threat to any sort of land mass and is more than likely going to be a swell and a rainmaker for the Cabo Verde Islands off to its north and west currently. I'll take you in for a closer look to Tropical Storm Lee. I do anticipate during the next advisory, if not later on this evening, we will see him make the transition to an actual Cat 1 hurricane. Looking at the latest National Hurricane Center information, the track is steadfast off to the west and northwest, really quickly deepening into a major hurricane as early as 8 a.m. Friday, we could see this happen earlier. Depending on whether or not the environment remains conducive for development and for extra strengthening in terms of its Category 3 and above threshold, that could happen a little earlier than what National Hurricane Center is anticipating. But there are some factors that are limiting his rapid intensification even right now. We'll cover that here in a moment. Now, or I should say, as of 11 a.m. this morning, winds are at 70 miles per hour in the center. This is going to rapidly accelerate in an upward direction as he moves further and further off to the west, and I do anticipate the wind field around his center of circulation is also going to rapidly expand once he does undergo cyclogenesis into a Cat 1 hurricane and thereafter. Now, I do want to turn your attention to the northern Lesser Antilles Islands and parts of Puerto Rico as well, because despite where this track is going, I do want to highlight some potential threats that these islands still have to watch out for. Before I do, let's take a look at this marvelous storm on Visible Satellite. Visible Satellite has to be my favorite overlay and my favorite Metsat shot to look at these storms, because look at the symmetry and the thunderstorm activity we have, not only around the core of the storm, but wrapping around it. This is as textbook of a hurricane, I'm calling it, that you could possibly get, and it makes sense as to why this thing's anticipated to undergo explosive cyclogenesis as we get towards the back end of the week and into the weekend. Before we even get onto the chart and the water vapor shot, you can kind of see a little bit of an entryway down along its north and western quadrant. This is indicative of some dry air that's trying. It's trying its dangdest to prevent Lee from strengthening into a major hurricane. This will only play an influence in his intensity, I believe, for another maybe 24 hours. Right now, we have the core of the circulation really closed off. There's a tremendous amount of thunderstorm activity occurring right around where that center is, and you can, as a matter of fact, see some really good overshooting tops beginning to fire off right where that eye wall would be. So I truthfully don't see this dry air really playing much of a role after the day today. Moving right along to Windy, you can see that our storm is rapidly organizing, and his right front quadrant is becoming a lot more evident on this overlay in terms of wind speed and intensity. I'll go ahead and rewind the shot just a little bit. We still have remnant high pressure situated off to its west-northwest that is likely to help level out the forward progress. Right now, if you noticed on that satellite image, it looks like we're booking off at a direction of about 310 to 320 degrees northwest. However, I do anticipate if this high pressure can sit around for just a little bit longer right in through here, you can still see that clockwise spin that I've alluded to over the last couple of episodes of Weather Center Nazario. If that high pressure can hold out for just a little bit longer, I do foresee we'll see a bit of a westward leveling out of the track of this storm once it finally gets above the next couple latitude lines. Now the primary reason I want to still mention some impacts to our Lesser Antilles Islands as well as Puerto Rico is because of the size of this storm. I've been seeing a lot of folks on social media and on YouTube alike mentioning that this storm is anticipated to stay well to the north of an actual substantial impact. However, I do believe a lot of the wraparound feeder bands along his southern and southwestern flank are going to play a role in the island nation's weather conditions as it gets closer and closer and eventually passes just to the north of them. If this system does undergo rapid cyclogenesis as well and deepens into a major hurricane by the time it's just 
to the north of our Antilles Islands, we are going to see lots of rip current conditions, very increased swell and surf conditions along the coast and the beaches as well. I do believe most of the Antilles and Puerto Rico are going to see a lot of increased precipitation or thunderstorm activity with this system as it moves along. So we can't count any kind of influence out of the picture for our islands regardless of how far to the north this system wants to track. Moving on to the water vapor image, now you can see that there is a little bit of an indication that there is some dry air trying to work its way into that center of circulation. Albeit, its acts are essentially futile because as that core continues to wrap up in of itself, the thunderstorm activity forms a perfect sphere around the eye, the foreseeable eye that we have coming over the next couple days. I don't think it's going to play as much of an influence in the next 24 hours, and despite this rigorous dry air out ahead of it, it's really not going to have any probability of intruding on this storm structure. With all the outflow that we have building up around this storm as well, it's only going to increase the relative humidity and moisture in the atmosphere, so it's going to be a repetitive cycling, if you will, of this storm self-sustaining as it punches through this pocket of dry air. On this water vapor shot in particular, you can kind of see what the big picture synoptic pattern looks like. We have a resemblance of a frontal feature and some jet activity out ahead of it just up through here. We have an inverted trough kind of situated over the Caribbean islands affecting Jamaica, parts of Cuba, Dominican Republic, and Haiti. That's also likely to help diminish our high pressure out ahead of this system and allow it to move a little bit further to the north. And then even further back upstream over the mainland United States, you can see this really potent dry air working its way towards the south and east. That is our next frontal system that will hopefully grab this storm and work it off to the north and eventually the northeast away from any significant landfall. All right, the 12Z Euro is not fully pulled in. It's not fully populated just yet, but let's go ahead and take a look at some model data anyways. 48 hours from now, you can see a rapidly deepening cyclone just due east of our northern Lesser Antilles and a really good mid-level ridge over the central Atlantic that's going to keep driving the storm off to the west at least for a little while longer. At about the 72-hour mark, you can start to see a really good trough and associated upper low working its way off the southeastern coastline. This is what should instigate a bit more of a northward path with our Lee. You can also see an indication of a deepening cyclone upstream of Lee. This is likely Margo finally getting its tropical storm name status as it works its way further and further away from the African coast into the central parts of the Atlantic Ocean as well. And it looks like there's a little bit of vorticity indicated even upstream of Margo that could be our next disturbance to kind of keep an eye out for as we go through the next 7 to 10 days. Let's really fast forward now. You can get a better idea of what it is that the atmosphere is preparing to do. Here's our trough over the upper Great Lakes, kind of the central plains, getting ready to prepare it for its exit over the mid-Atlantic northeastern states. Our ridge is starting to be heavily eroded and looks a lot more lower in amplitude, which is going to allow for a weakness to let this storm slip northward. It could work its way in between the island of Bermuda, or it could get dangerously close to them. It's all going to be a matter of timing. This is one of our first features that could pick up and steer this storm to the north, albeit in between Bermuda and the United States, closer to Bermuda, or if it doesn't come off with as much of intensity as the models have predicted the last couple of days, it could try to steer it up towards the very uppermost northeastern coastline, even the East Canadian provinces of New Brunswick, uh, Nova Scotia, and even further off to the east than that. So as it stands, there's no guarantee that we are going to see this storm miss any major landmass at this time, and there also is no guarantee that we will see a substantial landfall out of Hurricane Lee as it begins to track closer to Bermuda and the northeastern coastline of the United States. To give you a better idea of the big picture synoptic pattern over North America, and you can kind of see what the steering influences are as Lee approaches a potential landfall, at about 90 to 96 hours out, you can see our upper air pattern beginning to get a little more meridional. When I say meridional, it means our long wave pattern is becoming a bit more amplified or the waves are getting that much higher or deeper. In this case, you can see a pretty good trough axis off the west coastline, a growing mid-amplitude ridge over western conus, and a trough beginning to dig down into the Great Lakes upper Midwest locations already encompassing much of central and eastern Canada. As we move through time, you can see that these features begin to deepen and further increase amplitude, and we're counting on this trough axis as it continues to spread out over interior parts of the United States to pick this storm up and move it away from any significant landfall. We're still quite a ways out. We still can't even see the tail end of what this synoptic pattern is going to look like and where it is going to influence this storm's trajectory. However, one thing that a lot of folks have brought to our attention is there is a bit of a concerning westward tug on this storm while it begins to move to the north. I'll go ahead and use my pen to kind of highlight this. The last couple of model runs have shown this upper northeastern turn. However, it is starting to try to jog it a little further to the west over time, so that is a trend we're going to have to keep our eyes open for. It's all really going to be a matter of what this ridge in the Atlantic looks like and the intensity of our trough as well as the speed of the trough over the northeastern United States. 
Okay, we move on to Weather Nerds so we can take a quick glance at some of the ensemble members. So the ensembles still show a pretty cut and dried west to northwest track over the next five to seven days. However, a lot of us are starting to notice that at this point in time, once we prepare for that northward track, because we're losing the influence of any predominant steering factors for this storm, it might slow down either a little bit or quite tremendously, depending on how long it takes for the next big entity in the upper air pattern to pick this thing up and scoot it away from us. As a result, you can see how our ensemble members become a lot less concentrated once we get to that point. Some of them want to swing it a lot closer to the eastern seaboard. Others, unfortunately, want to track it much further to the east more aggressively as a major hurricane and take it right into the Bermuda Island. So as of right now, uppermost northeastern coast needs to be watching and waiting until we get to the point in time five to seven days from now where we are anticipating that northward jog. And Bermuda really needs to be on alert with this because you can say about 75 to 85 percent of our ensemble members want to take this dangerously close to your location. And finally, last but not least, let's go on to WPC. There are two frontal features I want you to pay close attention to as we fast forward to the end of the week. Here's our first frontal system drape across to the northeast mid-Atlantic state digging its way down into the southeastern coastline. This could be potential figure A that picks up Lee and drives it out into the ocean and possibly towards Bermuda. As we go even further into time, 12Z on Tuesday and then finally 12Z on Wednesday, here's our next frontal feature that's expected to plunge even further south, supported by a 1024 high over the upper Great Lakes. Moving off to the southeast, that could be the next figure or figure two to pick up Lee and steer him away from the mid-Atlantic states and the northeast if it's potent enough to create that much of an eastward fetch. So again, it's going to be a matter of intensity and timing. I know we've been talking about that on Weather Center Nazario for the last several episodes, but in meteorology, you'll come to notice a lot of it is intensity and timing. And that's kind of why I like you guys tuning in to whether it be me or an official source of meteorology, weather in your local area, because we provide you with as accurate of a depiction of that timing and intensity that we can. Okay, let's shift gears real quickly, guys. Before we wrap up episode 22, I want to take a look at CPC's outlook for the rest of September. We can see that the Caribbean Sea is likely to be blanketed by an area of unfavorable environment as we go through the 13th through the 19th. However, comma, as we approach the back end of September, anywhere between the 20th to the 26th, look at how CPC indicates that we're going to see an increase in activity over the main development region as those waves start to reemerge off the African coastline and push westward. So we could have a bit of an ebbing and flowing phase as we go through the month of September. This is still the peak of hurricane season, so please don't take this chart with it, meaning that we're not going to see anything during the middle of the month and the activity will only begin to reignite once we get past the 20th. This is simply saying that conditions are not going to be as conducive for frequent development during the days of the 13th through the 19th and then things are expected to ramp right back up once we get towards the trail end of September and start approaching October. This allows me to perfectly segue to the conclusion of this episode guys. What I'm about to show you is entirely hypothetical. The GFS loves to predict long range tropical cyclones a dime a dozen so please do not take this as reality. Please do not take this as fear mongering. I simply want to bring light to something that I've noticed over the last couple days and with the last few storms that have worked their way through, whether it be in the Atlantic or closer to the United States, because this is something we're going to have to watch out for as we get closer to what CPC is indicating as a spike in activity out there in the Atlantic. So I noticed on the latest run of the GFS, this is 12 Zulu, we're way out into La La Land for this model, so that's why I say don't take this with any bit of reality or realism tied to it. I just want to bring up a hypothetical scenario. As you go through time towards the very late portions of September, kind of right around when CPC is thinking we could see an increase in activity. The GFS wants to form up another potential depression out in our Western Caribbean and deepen it into a tropical storm. The only reason I bring this up, guys, is because what has been our saving grace for the mid-Atlantic states, the southeast, and all the way up to the northeastern coastline have been these very rigorous troughs and surface fronts coming off the east coast and pushing into the Atlantic. Now, the reason I bring this up Hypothetical scenario. Let's say the GFS starts to trend and as we get closer and closer in time we start to see this entity pop up on the likes of the Euro and the Canadian model just as we saw with Adalia for example. If something were to form up in the Western Caribbean anywhere within this general source region or even further upstream over in the eastern parts of the Caribbean as they work their way off to the west and eventually the west-northwest, I have a dark feeling that these frontal systems coming off of the coastline, you can even see right now we have a 1020 high right over top 
atop the middle Mississippi Valley and Ohio Valley, driving a frontal system through Florida, the Gulf Coast states, and further eastward. If we get something to organize in the Caribbean, this likely spells doom and gloom for the central Florida peninsula and parts of Cuba. Because as these frontal systems continue to exit off the United States coastline, it's going to inevitably drive these storms off to the east and northeast. We saw a semblance of this when Adalia came through. We had a weaker frontal system and a high pressure in the Atlantic that helped drive her into the Big Bend area. However, as these fronts continue to gain in strength, this is going to be a scenario we have to really keep our eyes open for because Florida may not be out of the realm of a potential impact as we get in towards the end of September and early October. Before we close out, guys, I urge you, please do not take this as I'm predicting a storm at the very end of September. I anticipate that the GFS is going to adjust this. It's been trending back and forth with a lot of different circulations I've noticed as you get past the 300-hour mark. This is looking at September 22nd. We still have about three weeks before this happens, so we have a lot of time to see if this is even going to trend or if this is going to be a simple rinse, lather, and repeat with the model every single update we get every six hours. But I do want to make sure you guys are aware that as these synoptic features over North America intensify and start to try to bring fall in for much of the country, this could possibly put Cuba, Jamaica, and the Central Florida area under the gun for a future impact if we do see something decide it wants to take shape in the Caribbean Sea. Now, all that being said, guys, we're going to close out episode 22. We've officially reached the conclusion of episode 22 of Weather Center Nazario. Thank you, viewers, for tuning in today. I really look forward to continuing to provide coverage on Lee as this situation continues to unfold. And based on Climate Prediction Center's new anticipated outlook for the rest of September, it looks like Lee may not be the only entity on the horizon that I'll be reporting on. Please, I also want to leave the disclaimer that the information I presented to you with the long-range GFS at the very back end of episode 22 is no way, shape, or form what I'm anticipating over the next few weeks. However, based on the synoptic pattern over North America, this is something we want to pay attention to in the event we see something take shape in our Caribbean Sea. Otherwise, folks, once again, a sincere thank you for watching today's episode. Like, share, and subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. Please make sure your notifications are turned on so you don't miss a future update. But until then, this is Weather Center Nazario, signing out.